Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Rayburn. Uh, my name is David Livingston, and I am a deputy director uh, at the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center, where I lead our work on climate change and advanced energy. Uh, thank you all for coming today. It is a pleasure and an honor uh, to be seated up here uh, with such an illustrious panel. And given the many familiar faces in the audience, uh, I can already say with certainty, this is probably one of the more intelligent uh, rooms I've ever been in. And it's, uh, it's an honor to be bringing down the average IQ uh, by, by grace of my presence. Um, what are we gathered here to discuss today? Um, American research leadership and ensuring a safe climate. Uh, the United States is uniquely positioned to take a leadership position in addressing these challenges. Leadership to promote safety for US citizens and the global community requires research and innovation to assess and develop options and will necessarily draw upon a set of capabilities which the US and its research ecosystem are well, equi well equipped to provide. This is especially true in the still emerging field of climate intervention research, the topic of our discussion today. We are honored to have a distinguished panel of experts from across multiple domains and perspectives to shed light on the current state of research, the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead, and the imperative for US leadership. I'd also like to take this opportunity briefly to thank uh, the, the, the staff here at Rayburn, to thank Representative McNerney and his staff for, for helping put this together, and, and, and most of all, to thank Silver Lining for their partnership in putting this event together. You'll learn a little bit more about Silver Linings director, Kelly Wanzer, uh, to my left at the end of the table um, a little bit later during the panel. And so without further ado, it is an honor and a pleasure to introduce our first panelist, uh, the Honorable Representative Jerry McNerney. A, a few brief uh, uh, contextualizing remarks about, about Representative's background. Representative McNerney has served in Congress since the year 2007 and represents California's ninth district, which includes large parts of San, San Joaquin County in the Central Valley, as well as parts of the Contra Costa and Sacramento counties. In addition to an accomplished career in energy prior to joining Congress, uh, Congressman McNerney holds a PhD in mathematics and served several years as an engineering contractor to Sandia National Laboratories in New Mexico. He currently sits on the House Committee on Energy and Commerce as well as the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Finally, and very relevant for our conversation today, a year ago, Congressman McNerney proposed the groundbreaking Geoengineering Research Evaluation Act to provide for federal commitment to the creation of a geoengineering research agenda and an assessment of the potential risks of geoengineering, also known as climate intervention practices. We are honored to have him with us today and welcome his perspectives on this the, on the importance of U.S. leadership uh, for research that can contribute to a safer climate. We look forward to hearing a little bit more from you about your bill, about what you have planned for this year, and about your perspectives on how you see this emerging field. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I want to thank you for the introduction and for inviting us here. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for participating. It's an important subject. Uh, in, my, uh, in my belief system, the uh, United States government has a significant responsibility uh, to address climate change, um, and uh, we just saw a report on climate recently that showed how significant the threat is, um, and that includes both physical impacts and economic impacts, uh, but there's still a lot that we need to answer about climate change. We need to push for more research, and it's Congress's responsibility, in my opinion, to uh, fund research in climate, and that should focus on reducing carbon emissions. That should be our highest priority, reduce carbon emissions. Um, but we also need to look uh, at how uh, we can, uh, what, what the risks and implications for geoengineering activities are. I called for a hearing on geoengineering uh, earlier this year in the Science Committee. Uh, it was very informative, but still quite a bit of unanswered questions, uh, and so it's important uh, that we find a way to use uh, federal resources uh, to, to understand what the risks uh, and uh, implications are for, for geoengineering research. So uh, I know that there's uh, universities and private institutions are already funding research on climate change. Uh, having a, a governance for this issue is absolutely critical. 
Uh, and so again, I think the federal government has a significant role in doing that. Um, I, I did introduce uh, a legislation earlier this year on climate uh, geoengineering research, and um, it, it had an impact, but I think we need to work uh, across the aisle to make sure that there's bipartisan support uh, so that we can move forward uh, with, the, with the geoengineering uh, oversight. Um, and uh, with that, I guess I'll, I'll turn it back to, uh, to the panel. Terrific. Thank you very much, Representative McNerney. Um, Next up, I'd like to turn to, to Amanda Stout. Um, Amanda directs the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate, BASC, and the Polar Research Board, PRB, uh, at the National Research Council, where she leads strategic planning and provides institutional oversight. She's also led multiple National Academy's efforts on climate intervention, including a, a very important 2015 study reflecting sunlight to cool Earth. Interestingly, for our topic today, uh, Amanda is also an expert in climate communication for policymakers and the public, which is a crucial piece of any discussion of climate intervention. So much of this is about framing uh, and framing correctly and in accordance with, with the best current scientific knowledge. So with that, Amanda, tell us a little bit about perhaps the, the history of this research, which may go back a little longer than some people r recognize, uh, as well as what the academies has done more recently to advance that research. Thank you, David, and, and thank you for including me here today. I feel very privileged to be up here. Um, so I'm going to just uh, take a step through a few slides to give a little background on um, the academies and how we've addressed the issues of climate change and, in particular, climate intervention. I think this should work. So there's me. Um, so we were founded in 1863 um, to advise the government. Um, and we bring um, uh, to our work uh, a stature of the best scientists in the country. We, were, um, we have three uh, honorific societies that uh, recognize our nation's top scientists. Um, and in addition, we have a process by which we address issues that are scientifically challenging or contentious in a way that's objective and neutral and rigorous. Um, and so this is what we have done on, on climate change for a number of years. Um, and some of our earliest reports on climate change were in the 1970s, and some folks in the room might be familiar with the Charney Report that came out in 1979. And that's uh, one of the first uh, calculations of how much the climate might warm with a doubling of carbon dioxide. It was done in this little pamphlet that came out in 1979. I um, mean, since then, we've done dozens of reports on climate science, how do we understand the climate, um, on the our understanding of how the climate is changing, um, our um, sense of the various impacts it has, and a um, whole range of responses on mitigation, uh, adaptation, and on climate intervention or geoengineering. And I've just put up a handful of those here, um, but there, there are many, many more that have come out over the years. Um, including, actually, our most recent report on climate came out just um, last month. Um, or I guess in October, a little over a month ago, on negative emissions technologies or carbon dioxide removal, um, which is um, often lumped together as another form of geoengineering. Um, the first time that I can find that the academies talked about um, geoengineering was in this 1991 report called Policy Implications of Greenhouse Warming. Um, and they came up with a host of geoengineering options that we could consider at the time. Um, reforestation, which we are still thinking about today, um, a whole range of sunlight screening is what they called it at the time. Um, some of these are things we're still talking about today, uh, such as uh, various um, things that we can inject into the stratosphere, um, and some are things that we've mostly discarded, like space mirrors. Um, and then uh, they talked about ocean biomass simulate stimulation, which is ocean iron fertilization, another topic that's um, not getting as much attention recently. And finally, removing atmospheric CFCs. Um, the next treatment of this topic came in this pair of reports that we released in 2015. Um, there was actually a single committee commissioned to write a report on geoengineering. Um, the committee was chaired by Marsha McNutt, who is now the president of the National Academy of Sciences, um, former editor of Science Magazine, former uh, director of the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, and so we were very fortunate to have her help us in putting the, our reports together. And as, that's how all of our reports are done, are with committees of experts who volunteer their time to, um, to put them together. 
The committee decided actually to do two reports because they felt that very strongly that we should make, um, differentiate between strategies that remove carbon from the atmosphere and store it and those that are involved in reflecting sunlight to cool earth. Uh, sort of the technical term for the second one is albedo modification. So you'll see me kind of flip back and forth between those terms. Um, so why climate intervention? Why not geoengineering? Um, and that was something the committee thought about a lot. Um, first of all, they point out that there are other terms, um, other meanings of the term geoengineering having to do with things like mining, as you see here. Um, and they were concerned that engineering, um, the word engineering conveyed a more pre sense that we could um, control the climate more precisely than we really can. So they didn't want to give a sense that, that we um, had as much confidence as might be conveyed by using the term engineering. Um, and then lastly, they like the term intervention um, because it, it really conveyed that we're making an action to affect a certain kind of change. So it, it's sort of an intentional thing. They like to bring in climate into to make it clear that it's related to climate. So we try to use climate intervention, although it's hard to dislodge terms that other people are already using. Um, the, and I'm just going to step through the, the, the top level findings and recommendations of that report of, of the one that has to do with reflecting sunlight. Um, so their, their, their first thing was to say that we need a portfolio of solutions. Um, that we need to be thinking about mitigation and adaptation and also um, bringing the, some consideration of both um, carbon removal and reflecting sunlight into the mix as well. Um, but they were very, um, very strongly stated that there is no substitution for mitigation and adaptation. Um, the second thing they did is point out that there are a number of risks associated with albedo modification or reflecting sunlight um, to cool earth. Um, they could involve uh, decreases in stratospheric ozone, um, changes in the amount and patterns of precipitation. This is one that's particularly hard to simulate in the climate models and could have really significant impacts on ecosystems and human systems that depend on um, the uh, water uh, hydrological cycle as it is today. Um, there's a lot of concern about the fact that if you're reflecting sunlight, you're not getting at the root cause of climate change, the carbon emissions that are causing the climate to warm. Um, they talked a lot about um, a poorly understood um, regional variability. Um, they are concerned about the potential risk of being dependent on these approaches for um, thousands of years. Um, that if you were to start doing um, uh, uh, these solar geoengineering approaches and then you stopped, that there could be a rapid uh, impact on the climate change that could be very disruptive. Um, and that there was significant potential for unmitigated, unmanageable, and regrettable consequences. So they had a whole host of concerns that they um, laid out in some detail. Um, and that, if for that reason, they recommended that we not pursue these kinds of approaches right now that it's too premature for us to actually do any of this sort of albedo modification. Um, however, they felt like there might be a time in the future when we might need to. And if that happens, then we should do the research to understand these risks and how to do them better than we are today. Um, and so they did recommend that there be a federal research program undertaken to begin to understand them in more detail. Um, and they highlighted a whole host of different kinds of research that would be appropriate for that, res um, that research program. And that's about as far as they got in terms of fleshing out um, a research agenda, of kind of calling for it, but they didn't really get much further in kind of describing what it should include. Um, and um, then the other piece that they talked about is the need that there's more than science involved in making these decisions. There's, you have to think about the governance side of it as well. Um, and so they highlighted that there needed to be a serious deliberative process to examine um, what kinds of research governance is needed. So we're not even talking about governance of deployment, just governance of the research itself. Because if you're going to, for example, put some of this material into the atmosphere and have a climatically significant impact, um, then that would have global implications potentially. So how do you get to the point of being able to actually test some of these things in the atmosphere? Um, so they call for both more research and also governance of that research. Um, and that's um, where we got to um, where we are today. Um, and the, um, the, the study that was called for in the bill that Representative uh, McNerney mentioned um, calls for a process to develop a more detailed research agenda um, and a search governance pieces. Um, in the meantime, we've gone ahead and launched such a study at the academies. Um, 
predominantly with private funding that has come forward to support that study. Um, the study is going to actually have a two-fold um, focus. Um, it's going to look at um, the research needs in much more detail. Um, it will focus on atmospheric interventions, so things that you could um, put uh, in the stratosphere or in the marine boundary layer. Um, and I'm, I'm sure Kelly will talk more about marine cloud brightening and when, she, uh, and when she's up. Um, and um, so it's not going to focus on changes in the land surface, so like white, white roofs or um, other kinds of uh, land surface mm -hmm. albedo changes. Um, it's really going to focus on the atmosphere and climate pieces. Um, there's also going to, it also calls for a research agenda that looks at the potential impacts on the atmosphere, on the climate system, on ecosystems, on human systems. So um, it will be a broad research agenda. Um, it will look at things like technological feasibility. What would it take in terms of engineering design to get to the point that we would be able to deploy a system like this? Um, and then finally, it, has a, it calls for a research um, agenda around detecting, uh, monitoring, and quantifying the impacts, because that will be another important piece of uh, this moving forward. Um, it will have a parallel track that's looking at the governance piece. Um, so one of the things that's been challenging is that um, there are folks who are concerned about this research moving forward and say we need governance in order to do that. And then the governance conversations sometimes get hung up because they don't have a fleshed out research agenda to know what they should be governing. So we're hoping to address that by having these two pieces go together in parallel and have opportunities for them to have crosstalk between the two of them. Um, so we're partnering um, between the board that I direct and then an, another part of the academy that focuses on governance. Um, actually, the, my colleagues just got back from Hong Kong where they were at the big summit on human gene editing. So they are familiar with contentious, controversial scientific issues that require governance. Um, and we're delighted to have them involved in, the process, in, this, in this study as well. Um, and they're both looking at governance um, um, at international, national, and subnational scales. Um, looking to what already exists and where are places we can, we don't need additional governance, um, places where there may be models from other fields that we could apply to this one, and then gaps where there may be need for new kinds of approaches or, or, or um, uh, uh, systems in place. Um, so we are just in the process of starting that study. We have put out a call for nomination and have received nearly 200 nominees uh, for 16 slots. Um, so it's going to take us a little while <laughs> to go through that list and vet everybody and identify the committee members. We hope to be able to announce the committee members in early 2019, and it'll be about an 18 to 20 month process for the study where we'll have workshops and public meetings, um, and we encourage anyone who's interested to um, sign up for our newsletters. You can find, um, find your way there through these websites um, and, and attend those meetings and participate as we go forward. I will end there. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Amanda. Um, next, I'd like to turn to, to, to Kelly. Um, Kelly Wanzer is not only our, our partner in putting this terrific event together, um, she's the executive director of Silver Lining, which is a new policy and advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring safety for people and ecosystems in the face of climate change through understanding various different options for reducing heat in, in the climate, in the global climate system. She recently testified before the U.S. House Space Science and Technology Committee that Representative McNerney sits on. Um, and uh, she previously served as Principal Director for the Marine Cloud Brightening Project at the University of Washington. So she is intimately familiar with a variety of different techniques, technologies, and approaches that, that broadly fall under the climate intervention uh, uh, moniker. I, I'll finally note that she also served as an advisor to the Ocean Conservancy on Ocean Climate Risk and has an extensive background um, in the technology sector, so brings a very diverse uh, uh, and cross-sectional set of experiences and, and expertises to the, to the question of climate intervention. So Kelly, with, with kind of that excellent history being laid out by Amanda, perhaps you could walk us through the current state of play in the research uh, and what we're looking at over the next couple of years. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Uh, works better with sound. Uh, thank you, Congressman McNerney, for joining, um, and, and the panelists, uh, who I uh, really appreciate your expertise here. And thank you all for coming. I, I appreciate your interest and attention to this. Um, so yes, I, I plan to talk a little bit about the case for research, uh, um, a little bit about what these things are and what research looks like, and some thoughts on the way forward. 
Um, and so just as a reminder as to why we're here, um, we are concerned at silver lining with the near-term risk exposure that we have. Uh, so some of the indications are that we have exposure to risks in the next 20 or 30 years uh, when today's children will be in their prime. And so we want to do everything possible to make sure that we have options available to navigate that safely. And we think that, um, you know, that has to do with uh, part of the risk exposure has to do with uh, what we're seeing in terms of the climate trajectory and what the most optimistic scenarios are about the options in the current portfolio for addressing them. So with emissions reduction, we have some, some big industrial transformations to do to achieve what we would need to achieve to constrain temperatures below two degrees. And in the case of, of newer innovations for removing carbon from the atmosphere, these also take additional work to vet and a lot of time and energy to scale. So it looks unlikely that we would be able to significantly constrain temperatures in a 20 or 30 year time scale, or at least uncertain. And so part of the reason that we're looking at these alternatives is so that we might have more tools in the portfolio for addressing those kinds of near term risks. Uh, and as you know, and as the reports have described, these include some pretty big changes in systems that we care about and that support our communities, including the ocean and its productivity, including ice sheets and their effect on the way the Earth system works, including our infrastructure, which is um, attuned to the conditions that we're used to and is starting to face conditions that, that they weren't engineered for. So part of the, so, the, so that's kind of the underlying context for why we might be looking for solutions that operate in a near-term time scale in a little bit different way. And as Amanda pointed out, um, we're, at Silver Lining, we're big fans of scientific assessments and the expert bodies that do them. And there were two entities that did assessments of these proposed interventions in climate. One was the Royal Society in the UK, which did an assessment in 2009. And one was the National Academy of Sciences that did an assessment in 2015. And they went through the various options from mirrors in space to painting roofs white and, and different kinds of proposals. And they sort of landed on the, the idea that the most uh, promising interventions were the ones that influenced the reflectivity of the atmosphere. So what you're seeing here is a NASA simulation of clouds and aerosols in the atmosphere. And clouds and aerosols are what produce the reflection of sunlight away from Earth, and it's one of the big forces that moderates the temperate climate that we have. So the theory behind these interventions is were you to influence that reflectivity by a little bit, even a percent or two, you may be able to reflect back to space as much energy as greenhouse gases are holding in. And so that's the theory behind these interventions. Um, this is a picture of a, an anthropogenic uh, example of that phenomenon. So these are uh, cloud, cloud banks on the Pacific West Coast of the US. And the streaks that you're seeing in the clouds are the emissions from ships interacting with clouds to make them a little bit brighter. Um, these are known as ship tracks, and they're an important object of study in atmospheric science. But one, one of the ways that humans today influence the atmosphere is not only in their emissions uh, releasing greenhouse gases that trap heat, but also in their emissions releasing particulates that interact with clouds and reflect sunlight. And that phenomenon is happening today. So globally, all of our emissions, in, in addition to adding long-term greenhouse gas heating to the system, are also adding particulates that produce cooling. And you can see that here. So this is a relatively well-known IPCC chart that looks um, the bars on the left showing the sources of warming and the bars on the right showing potential anthropogenic sources of cooling. And so today, this is one of the large uncertainties we have in understanding and predicting climate is the way that particles interact with clouds and reflect sunlight and how that affects climate, and in particular, how anthropogenic emissions are doing that, and what kind of effect that will have as we reduce them. 
So that is one of the sort of related factors to this whole category is that there's a form of this that we're already doing accidentally. Um, we are cooling the planet, but we don't know exactly how or to what degree. Um, and so uh, one of the proposals for this type of cooling is similar to that, or uh, an attempt to be a more benign form of that, is using, instead of sulfate emission particulates in pollution, using sea salt aerosols from the ocean delivered from ships into low-lying clouds. So this is known as marine cloud brightening. This is one of the proposals for this type of cooling. This particular approach is, is temporary. It's short-lived, about two or three days. Um, and theoretically, it might be possible if you were to brighten about 20% of the marine clouds over the ocean to offset a doubling of CO2. But this is based only on what we know from a limited amount of modeling work. It's also possible that this might not work at all. And it's possible that it might affect weather and circulation in a way that's unacceptable. So this is something that we need to study to know whether this is something possible to do. Um, the second proposal for these types of cooling approaches is based on the observed effects of large volcanoes when they go off and they're strong enough to release particles into the stratosphere. So Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991. It released particles into the stratosphere, which were entrained and circulated for about a year. And there was an observed cooling effect on the planet. Uh, they went up to about a half a degree centigrade and gradually receded. And there was also an observed restoration of Arctic ice during that period. And Rafe Pomerantz does a really good talk on that. Um, and so that theory, um, this proposal was actually the first one. And it was originally proposed by Paul Crutzen, who won the Nobel Prize for the identification of the ozone hole problem. And he wrote a paper in 2006 proposing the idea that this might be used as a way to counter global warming. And so the proposal here is to see if there's a way to do this in a controlled fashion over a longer period of time to release particles into the stratosphere that would provide some cooling um, by brightening the stratosphere by about a percent. Um, the problem with the particles that volcanoes release, there are sulfates, and they can damage ozone. So one of the things you need to study is whether there's a way to do this that wouldn't damage ozone over time. And other factors like whether you heat up the stratosphere or change the climate in ways that you don't expect. So there's research to do here as well to determine whether this is feasible to do safely. But this is something that people think is a very promising idea in this area. And so what I'm going to show you now, if the video works, and I hope it does, this is a simulation from NCAR. Um, oops, didn't work. Um, and I don't know how to go backwards. Let's see. There is a back one underneath, but I don't know. Can you guys in IT get the simulation to run? Um, no, it's, there should be a button that starts a simulation. Oh, is it going? No, it's not going. Um, no, there's a button down at the bottom, like a looks like a video button. Oh, I've got it up here. It's just not showing. It's just not showing on the screen. Well, I will describe it vividly because this is a wonderful simulation produced by NCAR, um, and, and it's the first sophisticated model that combines a global climate model with a model that emulates or, or sim simulates a controlled distribution of particles in the stratosphere. And what it shows is um, the, globe on the, the, the globe on the right and the globe on the left. Uh, the one on the left uh, is simulating the business as usual, the trajectory that we're on. And the model actually follows the real world data up until from 1980 through today. And then they start to diverge where the globe on the left is, uh, is moving into towards a close to four degree scenario by the end of the century. And the globe on the right with the geoengineering stays in temperatures close to today. 
And so from a modeling perspective um, of this type of technique, there's some promise to indicate that we might be able to constrain temperatures. Oh, you found it, okay. Um, it's worth looking at because this, um, this is among the very few government-funded uh, studies in the United States. Um, it was funded by DARPA and built by scientists at NCAR. And so you can see uh, both worlds are tracking kind of historical data up until today. And there's an introduction of stratospheric aerosols at 2024 that gradually increases. And then uh, an ongoing uh, regime of stratospheric aerosol injection through the end of the century. And you can see how the worlds start to diverge in that circumstance. And so this is, I'll, I'll take the controller back if somebody has it. Oh, thank you. Um, so so th this is an example of what might be possible. Um, there's a lot that we don't know and many, many risks. There are also some theoretical proposals about how you might um, reflect sunlight at regional or localized levels um, to do more adaptive types of things. Um, and one proposal is the idea of brightening clouds over a large swaths of the um, Gulf Atlantic in the months before hurricane season to reduce ocean surface temperatures and therefore reduce the uh, energy of storms. There's another proposal and there's a, an academy study going on right now related to um, sustaining coral reefs and what might be possible in terms of cooling ocean surface temperatures in the area of water flowing onto corals in order to sustain them. These things are very uncertain, um, and they've had very little research applied to them. So they may not be possible, but they may, they may also be promising. Um, and we don't know a lot about the relative costs of these things, um, but just in terms of very broad strokes and, and what rough estimates might look like. Um, the cost of constraining temperatures in a short period of time um, is orders of magnitude lower in terms of this approach, um, which might allow for some flexibility in terms of transition. And uh, one of the things that we like to think about in terms of what these capabilities look like and what they might require is thinking about understanding the whole system so if you were to intervene in the system, you would be wanting to try to do it safely. And in order to do that, you want to have good capabilities for measuring what, baselining the system, measuring what's happening in the system, forecasting in advance uh, the interventions that you're making, and then making them. And in order to do that, we need not only to assess and understand these interventions, but we need to be better at predicting the Earth system and impacts. So we think that a research program involves not only research into interventions, but also an acceleration or improvement of our ability to predict the Earth system. We need, if we're going to intervene in the Earth system, we need to understand it better than we do today. So to that end, uh, to the end of assessing these capabilities, it appears that it will require not only models, but also observations and more sensitive observations than we have at the moment, as well as experiments, at least small-scale process-level experiments that tell us what kind of particles we're dealing with and how they behave in the very sort of near system. So we may not need to do things that actually impact the climate, but it's very important that we understand the behavior of the technologies and the particles as we release them. And to that end, uh, researchers have proposed a couple of experiment or experimental programs. One is from the University of Washington, which is a sequence of tests and experiments that would build technology for generating a sea salt mist from seawater, test it on land, then test it out on ships with ship track type of emissions, and then eventually test it on a region of clouds where you might be able to detect a meaningful brightening effect. And that sequence, if, if it was funded, is likely to take somewhere between six and nine years to do. 
And at the end of that sequence, you might be able to have a better understanding of whether you could brighten clouds and to what degree. So part of the moral of that story is that it takes a little bit of time to do these things and a little bit of money. Um, and they don't scale by themselves. So this is a very, these are all very small in atmospheric and environmental terms. They're non-impacting types of things. Um, but they're quite important if you want to have the information to feed into models to tell you what will happen. And another experiment is being proposed by the team at Harvard in the stratosphere. And they want to try to understand how, part of, how the types of different types of particles might behave in the stratosphere to understand what options we might have for, um, for deploying there. And so that's quite an important thing to do. They're proposing to use a balloon that navigates in the stratosphere, uh, releasing a handful of different types of particles in very small quantities, and measuring the chemistry and behavior of those particles in the stratosphere. And those types of experiments are really important to get that first order information to feed into things downstream. This is not dangerous to people or to the environment, but it's very important to do. And so in addition to specific experiments and specific study of these interventions, there are some technology capabilities that would help accelerate our understanding across the board. So today we have some limitations in the computing capacity that supports the models and calculations and data studies we want to do. Uh, climate research is second only to astrophysics and how much computing it takes to do it. So on planet Earth, it is the most computing intensive thing you can do. And so we want to try to involve more resources on the computing side, including some of the modern cloud computing companies to get more capabilities. Similarly, there are some new generations of platforms for remote sensing and those kinds of capabilities that would be very helpful. So we want to try to accelerate those technologies into understanding these things better as part of a research program. And they're going to help us understand the climate better, climate impacts better, and any interventions we might make. So, so we think that research, or, or our assessment is that research in this area involves two things. It involves assessing these specific interventions to find out if any of them are feasible and whether we can understand their risks well enough to, to entertain doing them. And the second is to improve our ability to predict the Earth system. And so we think that this information is something that policymakers need to make decisions and that, that policymakers need to govern these capabilities in the future. And that given our time constraints, we probably need programs that can help deliver these in the next decade. Uh, and they're very interdisciplinary, and I won't go into too many details, but, um, but these are our pretty sophisticated um, kind of cross-functional programs that, that, we need, that we need to fire up. And, uh, and overall, they're going to involve a little bit of a matrix of society. So we need the scientific assessment functions, we need the academic institutions, the federal research capabilities, the tech sector, and a few other folks to act in concert so that we can rapidly generate the information we need to understand these things. And I'll just give you a little bit on the US context before I wrap up. Um, but there are a handful of agencies. So as many of you know, there are 13 federal agencies with climate research programs. There are a handful of them that have been a little bit um, more engaged on this topic, although none of them have programs yet. Um, and so the Department of Energy, NOAA, NASA, DARPA, um, and NSF, uh, all are likely early players in their angle on studying these kinds of problems. Um, and, and where we might think about research. Um, we think the National Academy's assessment functions are really important, and that what their report is likely to do is probably give us some blueprints that are going to be important to follow. In the international arena, uh, the United Nations Environmental Program and the Montreal Protocol in particular have really strong assessment functions for looking at the stratosphere. And that may be a place to start, at least with some of the risks of the stratospheric approaches. Um, finally, I'll say in the US context that we have solved these kinds of problems in a limited space of time before. And I'll give you two examples. Um, one is the Montreal Protocol. 
and addressing the ozone crisis. And that was a bipartisan effort. It was actually led by Republicans in the 80s. It established the Montreal Protocol. That is the only environmental uh, regulatory function that is legally binding and signed by all countries in the world. The only one. Um, and it operates quite successfully. Uh, the second I'll say, maybe less familiar to you, is the Great Plains Shelter Belt Program, uh, which happened after the Great Depression, uh, when the dust storms were um, affecting agriculture in the Midwest and the US. And it's the largest environmental engineering program in US history. They planted 200 million trees through the, through the central US. And if you drive through there, you can still see those lines of trees. Um, and they changed atmospheric conditions and they changed agricultural conditions. It was also a really good labor program for people to get back to work. So, um, so there is precedent for solving these kinds of problems and hope in that. And, um, and with that, I will turn it over to Makai. Or back to David, sorry. Terrific, thank you, Kelly. Well, uh, we're, getting there, we're getting there anyway. So, so that was a terrific, terrific overview of the current state of play in the science. Um, and I hope that Makai, uh, can help us to zoom out um, and, and, and bring, us, bring us back to the kind of the, the DC conversation here. What's the role of Capitol Hill? What's the role of the federal government? What's the role of policy in navigating both the research and the, and the governance of that research? Um, there are very few people who, who are better suited to, to kind of speak on that in an expansive way than Makai Campbell. Um, Makai is currently the managing partner of Blue Water Strategies uh, here in Washington, DC. And he has over 30 years of government and private sector experience uh, in energy and natural resources, including previously serving as the staff director of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee uh, for Senator Lisa Murkowski. Um, so, Makai, if you could give us your views on this, in particular what seems to be a relatively bipartisan area, uh, at least at the moment, in, in terms of pushing forward the research and, and leaning into American strengths in, in R&D and science capabilities. I, I will certainly give it a shot. And David and Kelly, I want to thank both of you for organizing this and bringing it together. And I was real curious to hear the introduction to have you explain why the heck I'm up here. <laughs> but, um, let, me, let me just start. I, I think this should be an area of relatively bipartisan activity. But let me start real broad about just a real quick take on the whole climate debate and stuff. And and. It's a very difficult, difficult debate because on the one hand, you have a large group of people who are absolutely convinced of the seriousness of the nature, uh, the nature of something, but what they're proposing it seems to many people is theoretical, and they're bumping up against the actual what it takes to deal with that. And when you have theoretical and actual, no matter how dangerous the theoretical, it almost it's a very, very tough sell. Also. For a lot of years now, we've had a lot of very well-meaning people going, the sky is falling. By now, the ice caps should have all been melted, et cetera, et cetera. People, most people out there aren't scientists, but they absorb impressions. And the impressions they've absorbed is, wait a minute, we've been hearing this is, the world is ending, the sky is falling, and it keeps not happening. And then it makes them doubt a lot of other things. And what's going to be really, really difficult as proponents of we've got to do something to be relatively restrained. I think it's one of those things where restraint will actually be far more effective than shouting, you know, and hollering and uh, the problems and we're all going to die. I, my, I've talked to Kelly about it as I see it sort of as an example of you don't have to believe that your house is just about to catch fire to know that it makes sense to have fire insurance, that it makes sense to have smoke detectors, that it makes things, sense to have fire extinguishers. And it also, you don't have to believe your house is about to catch fire to know that it makes sense to figure out what a fire extinguisher is before the house is on fire. And so that's the way I look at research on a lot of this work there, you know, that we desperately need to do it. I also think research is something that can bring us together on the climate issue because, frankly, there are a lot of opponents out there or people who just don't care. When they see research on what are we going to do about it, being rejected, or if they see adaptation not being followed, et cetera, they say, or, or they say, well, it can't be that serious because they're really not doing anything. And there are some folks, I mean, I, an example I use is Naomi Klein's book where she says, 
This, her book is This Changes Everything, where she says we're going to use climate as the lever to change the capitalist system. A lot of people then who are very fond of the capitalist system go, in that case, I don't believe any of it. You know, And so the question is, I, I do understand that there is strong concern by many climate activists that if we look at research how to deal with it, that that will take the pressure off of what we do in terms of reducing CO2 and other things. I, I really am totally convinced that it is exactly the opposite, that when people who are trying to make up their minds see us not looking at every alternative and everything else, they don't believe it can be that serious, because if it was, you'd be doing something about it. You'd be doing everything you could about it. <clears throat> so I do know you all had one of the best bipartisan committee hearings that I think of last year uh, on, on this subject. It is a subject that is very amenable, presented right to bring people together. Um, I think this is one where rather than focusing on what separates us, we need to focus on what can bring us together. And, uh, and that sounds a little goody two shoes, but I think this is, this is an area where it is, where it is amenable. I also think, I would one slight caution, I totally get and accept <clears throat> the need for global governance. I would also be somewhat careful how you say that to the body politic. If you think you want to bring a bunch of Trump supporters on, on board to support what you're doing, you say, it's going to be global governance. It won't be helpful. Um, not probably telling anybody that anything they don't know there. Um, anyway. I just would urge us all to look at the portfolio of situations to all be restrained in our, <laughs> in our discussion to give some credence to the people on the other side, even people who seem willfully ignorant that, that it's so much better to bring along through here's all that we are, believe it's so serious. I mean, we're looking at what's happening in France right now with all the yellow shirts where, you know, I think the gas tax was for a very good re reason and cause but they're by dealing with the actual Im impact of that. And so I just say let's be very careful about it. Let me kind of shut up here and get on to questions, and then we can talk more if that's all right. Well, that was a terrific cue and great framing. I, I mean, the, the question that I naturally want to ask after that is you talked about the fact we might disagree over the urgency of fire risk or how fire prone our house is. Um, and we could argue that all day, but we probably all agree that we, we do want to kind of understand what fire extinguishers are available to us, maybe invest in one, maybe invest in learning how it works. Um, when we talk about climate intervention strategies, and, and I want to focus in particular on sunlight reflection, how well do we understand the risks inherent to that fire extinguisher as well? Um, are there risks in how we yield it? Do we understand how well it works? Um, what's our current state of knowledge as it stands today uh, in, in terms of that tool, that fire extinguisher, for facing this problem? Maybe Kelly or Amanda want to jump in on that one first. Um, so I'll remind everyone that today there are no formal sources of funding for research. So there, there's a, a small amount of active research happening, um, mostly the Harvard program and research is related to that, um, and some where researchers find other funds. But generally speaking, therefore, the body of work around this is small. And so our level of uncertainty is very high. It would be as if we had you know, guys in garages looking at fire extinguishers, smart guys, but you know, we, we haven't had substantive programs yet to help narrow that uncertainty around what the risks really are. So at the moment, it would be very risky um, because we haven't been able to study the risks yet. And I'll let Amanda weigh in. I don't think I have much more to add, just to, you know, I think that that's absolutely right. We haven't really invested in the research to really understand these tools yet, um, and so we're, um, really at that point of kind of just even feeling out what the, what a fire extinguisher even might mean in this context. Please. I'd like to jump in. You know, uh, there's, there's risks of implementing mm -hmm. um, albedo modification, and I think those risks, we don't understand them, and so that makes them more dangerous because the risks are unknown and they could be catastrophic. But there's also risk with not doing research so that we don't know what our options are. So if we balance the risk of, of doing nothing versus the risk of research, I think uh, we have to weigh in on, on uh, doing research is, is a much better gamble. That's a great point. Um, 
I wonder, this isn't just a U.S. conversation anymore anyway. Uh, you know, Amanda, some of those first reports you presented were probably at a time when the U.S. was the only place in the world where this was really going on, at, at, you know, at, at, in a serious way. Um, I imagine that, or even if that wasn't the case, it's, it's much less the case today. Um, I can think of a, a, a handful of, of, of global, global economies, global powers that, that have both the scientific capabilities to do serious research in this field and that also have the financial means to digest the kind of uh, relatively modest sum that Kelly put up there as, as a potential estimate of what it would take to stay within two degrees with some of these technologies. Could, could each of you talk a little bit about, from, from your own vantage point, um, how you view the U.S.'s role in a global system in all of this? Um, uh, what, what other actions are being done by, by Europe, by China, um, et cetera? And, uh, and, and is there a risk that if the United States doesn't invest in understanding these technologies and the risks and opportunities inherent in them, um, that we're, that we're going to fall behind before discussions have even started on, uh, you know, on, on how to potentially implement these? Well, the there is there the, the United States uh, has a significant leadership responsibility because our emissions are so significant, and we've been emitting carbon over over a century or so. And so, uh, we have the technology, we have the financial resources, we have the scientific resources. So we have a significant responsibility uh, in this, and we also want to look at at other. Um, nations like China as partners in this. We don't want to look at them as uh, competitors necessarily. Uh, we want to look at them as how can we work together to do this. And I think that's where the international cooperation, I don't want to use the word governance here too yeah. liberally, but uh, how international cooperation can be very beneficial. So I'll just say, in the context of scoping out the study that we're just starting now, we thought it was very important to have international um, engagement in that process. So we intend to put um, uh, probably two to four members of the committee will be from other countries. And so that's one of the ways we want to make sure that we have that kind of connectivity. Um, my understanding is that there are some research efforts have, that have um, been supported in China and in Europe. There's some interest in India. Um, so we're going to be looking to try to engage with those existing efforts. And I guess the other thing I would just say is that climate research is an inherently global undertaking. And so we, you know, we, I think it makes sense from a scientific perspective as well that we're kind of thinking about this problem in a global context in the global research community. Makai, um, did you want to win? Okay. Well, I, I was just, just going to say global cooperation sounds a lot better than global <laughs> <laughs> People like co cooperating. They don't like to be governed sometimes. <laughs> um, so so a, couple, a couple of specifics on uh, what, I, what I know of international activity. Um, so there is a group in Europe uh, called IASS, which has been sponsoring researchers in the developing world to look into climate intervention techniques so that that, that would help a more shared understanding of what these things are and some ability to weigh in on them. Um, and generally speaking, there, has been, there have been some favorable recommendations from the developing world and countries who are experiencing the impacts of climate change now um, on interest in research in these kinds of options. There was a meeting in India on July 24th um, and the, uh, the in Indian Science Foundation has launched a modeling program in this area um, there was a meeting in Africa the previous year, and so there's, there's kind of a smattering of interest coming that way. And then in China launched a $3, three million a year modeling effort a couple of years ago. And this year they've been reaching out to re senior researchers in the U.S. about joining a consortium. So there appears to be some interest coming from there. Um, what I will say about the U.S.'s role, just to remind everyone, as many of you know, the U.S. has the largest concentration of climate research assets in the world. And the U.S. still supplies a lot of the climate and weather data to the rest of the world for their research. Um, and so our capabilities, our observations, our people, our computing platforms, there, there are not the equivalents yet anywhere else. 
And so it's likely that they're going to be quite important to mobilize to understand these capabilities. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there may be things that we can do to enable more easily international collaboration um, and sharing of data and things like that. That's, that's really interesting. I, Mikai, did you want to follow up on that? The, the only th other thing I was going to say is one of the reasons that I've been very interested in the cloud brightening projects is it seems to me as we look at all these different alternatives, it makes a lot of sense to progr progress from those with the least potential to go wrong to more draconian methods. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, cloud brightening, we try it, we stop it, it goes away pretty quickly, worked or didn't work. You dump a bunch of iron filings in the Southern Ocean, that's a very different situation. And so I think, you know, approaching things on sort of a spectrum of, of potential danger and irreversibility makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. These systems have some hysteresis, in other words, yeah. Um, and it's important to, to focus on the things where you can experiment without without uh, uh, crossing those thresholds. Um, I want to cue in, as, uh, again, just on the, the, the politics of this a little bit and the policy about, of this. It, it's often forgotten, especially in our current environment, um, that you know the, the Montreal Protocol was championed by George Shultz uh, under the Reagan presidency, that the world's real first effective kind of environmental market cap and trade system happened during the George H.W. Bush administration. Is there something about um, leaning into this, uh, y you know, th these kind of, as Kelly put it, these superlative American research capabilities that could help reframe some of the climate debate um, in, in a way where we help dispel both the head in the sand community and, and Mackay, the, the, the kind of alarmist community that you were worried about as well? Is this an opportunity? I really believe that it is. Uh, this is where you have to add in the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act were both very bi totally bipartisan mm -hmm. issues. Um, I, I think the issue of what can we do, whether it be looking at the entire portfolio of solutions, including um, things like cloud brightening, including things like adaptation, including the white, then if you're doing all those things, people start to believe, well, they are serious. They're not just trying to inflict some other preconceived goal upon you. And uh, it's a step, but I think it's an important step. Well, uh, I mean, we clearly need to reduce carbon emissions. That's got to be our highest priority. Um, in the House of Representatives, uh, I think it was in 2008, we passed the American Clean Energy and Security Act. It was a, car it was a cap and trade policy proposal, a very complicated um, carbon taxes, I think, are, are make more sense, but we have to have political buy-in. I mean, we can't just have the Democratic Party putting uh, a carbon tax system in place and then ramming that down the throats of the American people. It just won't work. We see what's happening in Paris. We saw a, uh, a reversal of a carbon tax in Australia a few years ago. I mean, we have to have the public buy-in. It has to be done in a way that uh, shows the people uh, of the country the benefit of that program. Uh, for example, um, uh, a, a carbon tax that would be refunded to the American people in some way, also building infrastructure. So it's, it's not an easy program, but we have to move forward on that. Uh, and that's got to be our highest priority. But moving forward, uh, given the acceleration of the, of the, uh, of the climate changing, we, we're going to have to do, we're going to have to understand what our options are. And that's why I'm proposing research. We have to know what our options are in terms of uh, of geoengineering, is albedo too big of a risk? Is cloud brightening make more sense? Uh, does removing carbon from the atmosphere mechanically, what do we do with the carbon? I mean, these are questions that need to be addressed on a research basis urgently. Right, do we have another question out there? Oh, uh, Mackay, let's take a swing at that I'll, one. I'll add one, one. I, I agree with everything that you said, and I appreciate it. I'd add one other thing, and this one may be a little more controversial. I absolutely feel that renewables have a strong place in the, in the marketplace for emission-free energy, and I think that it needs to grow. Um, but I think whatever forms of energy we're looking at, we need to be very analytical about it. There's a lot of attachment to certain forms of energy that's sort of a, almost a sentimental attachment or a religious attachment or something. Um, I, I also think that there, we need a lot of work on looking at advanced nuclear. Um, one of my threshold questions with people who are talking 
about, you know, the real need to reduce emissions is how do you feel about nuclear? And if it's, you know, if they have concerns, that's very legitimate. But if it's that they don't even want to talk about it, I don't believe they're serious about the issue. And I go talk to other people. <clears throat> Great. Well, uh, oh, Amanda, real quick. And I think the one thing I would add to this is that there's not going to be a single policy that's going to solve the problem or a single silver bullet that's going to be the answer. At least all the reports that we've been doing have shown that we're going to need investment across a whole host of different sorts of options. Um, the, the negative emissions report we just put out had 50 separate line items of different research needs. Um, and yeah. And, and not a, a significant yeah. price tag as well associated with them. Um, and that's just one part of the solution set. Um, and so I think um, we, we need to be thinking very broadly about this as a grand challenge for um, our nation and the world. <laughs> Terrific. Um, question here. Yes, sir. <laughs> So a question about the funding this research, funding these multiple different priorities, uh, and and how Congress should be thinking about tackling this issue uh, in the in the next Congress coming up. Well, one of, one of the most effective things is if you hear from your constituents that that this is about your interests. Uh, I'm the constituent talking to a staff or a representative. Um, this is going to create jobs in your district, or it's going to lose jobs in your district if you don't do it. I mean, that I think is the most effective way is to is to get. The, the constituency to, to let the representative and staff know that that's an important issue to them. Kelly, yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll weigh in since Ocean Conservancy asked the question, but um, but I do think it's actually, it's, it's useful to hear also from environmental organizations um, that they may be open to this um, because that hasn't necessarily been the case. And so it, it, there is definitely something to look at in terms of the preservation of systems that we care about. And so I think it's also potentially interesting for, for people to hear from you guys also. Yeah. I would just add, I think discussion of sort of the insurance approach to things makes a lot of sense and support across a broad portfolio makes a lot of sense. And uh, a real avoidance of what the appearance of rent seeking, because there's a lot of that that goes on, in, not just in this area and everything in Washington, but uh, <laughs> on that. Very sound advice. Yes, a question up here. Yeah, Mark Aiken with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, one of the things you brought up was the impact on coral reefs. And one of the things in the latest IPCC report, the, the, the period where we're referred to as the burning ember diagram. not only dealing with the question of can you cool things, but can you cool things in a particular place that they can so a great question on um, on focusing on coral reefs, some of the threats there, one of the most uh, the most battered ecosystems by the, the levels of, of, of climate system change that we've seen, and about targeting or localization or regionalization of climate intervention approaches. Who wants to take that first? Well, in, in the spirit of how much interest that we've seen, um, for me, this is a particularly kind of heartbreaking area because the heat stress on corals is profound. Um, and there are other stressors on corals, but heat exacerbates them all. And, um, and I'm from Silicon Valley, and there's a fair amount of ocean philanthropy there. Um, and it's been very difficult to talk to people in ocean philanthropy about this. And so a relatively modest amount of research might tell us whether it's worth pursuing further for corals, even, even some data and atmospheric studies to help us really understand whether this is worth chasing after. Um, but I would say right now, it has not been on the radar, and it's been difficult to get on the radar. There is a small kind of uh, modeling study program funding in Australia 
associated with the Great Barrier Reef. But even there, considering uh, what a national asset that is, um, it's not on, on the radar sufficiently. And I think you were the one in, in Ocean Conservancy that talked to me about that the coral reef system supports 25% of life in the ocean. So as an experiment into the full impact on the full ocean system, this is a, maybe not, not understood well enough by people just, just how big this potential impact is and how relevant it might be to study for this particular system. Any else, uh, uh, Mackay? Yeah. I'd also add that when talking to people um, about climate and the dangers and stuff, without being at all condescending, it's sometimes maybe useful to explain some things that we just sort of all know. And that is, for instance, there are a lot of folks who think, okay, it's having an effect on the coral reef here, but maybe areas farther north will be a little warmer and the coral reefs will go there. Or they, people know enough to know the Earth has been much warmer than this. Two degrees, what's that big deal, et cetera. But it's the rapidity of the change, and we don't talk about that, the rapidity of the change and that impact, and the organisms not having time to adapt as much. That's very useful. Absolutely. Another question. Uh, gentleman at the far back, yep. A question about kind of the, the role of the private sector, the fossil fuel industry in particular on this, uh, both traditionally and uh, what, what you're seeing as current trends. I mean, I'd have to say that's a loaded question, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, the, the evidence is, is, is pretty good. Uh, the, and I don't want to get too particular, but I want to uh, sort of reflect back on the, on the tobacco uh, industry and how that influenced federal programs for quite a while until it was uh, pretty undeniable that there was a link between cancer and, and tobacco. Um, so yeah, there's there seems to be a degree of influence. I don't see it directly. I don't see uh, my colleagues on one side of the aisle or the other saying, well, geez, uh, I, I, I'm getting money from the oil industry. I can't vote with you. I don't hear anything like that. But uh, there's there's ways to use money indirectly now uh, that uh, it can 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 shelter. Or, or, or blind where that money is coming from, and I think that's an important issue. And I, I, do, I just want to make a plug here. Um, you know, we're, we're all care, everyone here cares a lot about climate change. We're here because we care about that issue, but uh, if, if campaigns are continue to be financed the way they're financed, we're going to have a tough time addressing this and other very important issues that are facing our country. A structural point. Yeah, Rafe. Maybe a quick identification oh, too. Well, I mean, you're raising a sort of a question in a bigger context is that uh, we, we put a pitiful amount of money into research on energy uh, development, and, and, um, and so I think that's a, that's a critical shortcoming that we have. RPE is a, it's a well, ARPA, is a, DARPA is a great program. Uh, I mean, depending on your, on, on your attitude about, uh, you know, the defense posture of this country, but um, RPE, I think, is, is a wonderful program, but uh, we need to build that up slowly with confidence. I mean, I, I think there's going to be an appetite in this next Congress to move forward with, with additional resources for RPE. I, I do feel that, but we, uh, again, uh, going back to McKay's comments, we have to get buy-in on both sides of the aisle here, and using innovation, uh, that's, a, that's a word that everybody likes, and everybody likes to throw that around, so 
Uh, let's throw that around and try to get some more money for uh, RPE. Yeah, I'm all, I'm, I'm, I'm all for this. I'm behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, one final question over here, uh, and then I think uh, this won't be the end of the discussion. We'll just move it over to the snack table. So please. Great question from uh, an Austrian student representing the, the generation that's going to have to deal with a lot of these questions about how to affect individual level change, uh, individual level attitudes and individual level change. Um, not forcing people, but getting people to do it collectively for the right reason. Amanda. Yeah, I wish we had the answer to that question. <laughs> um, there, first of all, there's a whole <coughs> body of research about behavior change. And so that's something that people have studied a lot. So. Um, I, and I, I couldn't do justice to that at this point. Um, but one thing that struck me about what, when um, Representative McNerney was talking was about how you have to approach these conversations with mutual respect and sort of treating the other people's um, opinions um, as, um, I don't know exactly how you said it, I'm not doing you justice, but <laughs> I, the, the notion that these conversations need to be approached with some level of respect. And I spent a number of years working for National Wildlife Federation talking to hunters and anglers about climate change. Um, in, in the U.S., that's a relatively conservative um, group. Um, and the way we did it was talk to them about what they observed in their day-to-day -day experience um, and how they've seen nature changing and help them like kind of think through it from their own experience. Um, and I think that is something that's really important as we're talking about getting people on board with climate change is helping people connect it to their own experience. Um, and I think that's going to become, unfortunately, an easier and easier thing to do as we see the wildfires um, and storms and other things that are affecting more and more people. Kelly. Um, so I get asked this question a lot as well, just from being out there talking on, on this issue. And, um, and I also get asked by people like, do I have to stop eating beef? Do I have to buy a different car? <laughs> And so um, what I say to people is, you know, I think the idea that there are litmus tests around which aspects of things you have to forego, but if there's something you can do less of in your life, can you buy less? Can you fly less? Can you eat less beef? You know, are there things that you can do that make sense in your context? That would be terrific. Please do them. Um, I also grew up in the 70s. I'm old. And or old, older, but uh, and um, <laughs> and I remember there were campaigns. You know, give a hoot, don't pollute. We there there there's a there's also the possibility that at, at a national level or at a governmental level, we could be encouraged to try. And I don't believe that we are today. And so I do think there's opportunity there also. And I I hope we take it. Right. With that, I want to I want to give the panel just an opportunity, real quick. We're we're here in Congress for a reason. We want to connect the scientific imperative with the political realities here. So as we approach the next Congress, I, I'd ask each of you to 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 think about um, what is the number one thing on your wish list for if we were to have this a year from now. We'd be saying it's a good year because at the very least we got this number one thing done to advance a responsible, thoughtful, and constructive climate intervention research agenda. Well, putting, uh, getting a research agenda and funding isn't that, isn't, isn't that big of a challenge compared to getting uh, the American people on board with significant change that needs to happen. And, and that's where we are. And uh, going back to Tim's question, you know, th there's, there's uh, interests out there that, that don't want us to change, and they're going to use their resources to prevent that. So uh, that's a huge challenge. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, it, it, instituting some sort of campaign finance reform would be a big help in that direction. Very structural change. That's a hard one for me to answer because we work for a you know nonpartisan mm -hmm. organization, non-lobbying, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
so I may punt a little bit just to say, one, I, you know, I'm hopeful that our study will have um, um, advanced the dialogue around these climate intervention approaches. We will have opportunities for workshops, and we hope that that will be a, a place where we can continue to um, um, ex advance the thinking and also bring more people into those conversations as well. Terrific. Okay. Um, in answering this question, I'm also going to go back to the question we had over here about how do you get people to care, because the way you change Congress and what Congress does is you change what people care about. And one of the things that I would say is fundamental to people caring about is having a strong economy. And, and this isn't the first thing that jumps to people's minds, but I will tell you that if an Indonesian fisherman is fishing on the reef, he's not worried about what his fishing practices are doing to the reef if he's worried about feeding his family the next day. Same thing if you have someone who's worried about heating their home or driving to work, and energy costs are highly regressive, and we need to keep that in our mind, then they're not going to worry and care about the environment. So we need to th have a strong economy. We need to be very analytical in our approach and approach each other with respect about what does and doesn't make sense. And then the last thing I'd throw in is, I think there's tremendous importance in avoiding hypocrisy. I will tell you that over sort of on the vast right, if you can characterize it that, every time there's a uh, climate summit, there are pictures that circulate of the airports with all the jets that have flown in and the movie stars who fly in on their private jets, one, one or two or three people on the jets. Avoid, and people say, clearly it doesn't matter. It's what they like to say because they're not acting like they mean it. And I, then I guess just each of us in our own life making you know, choices. You don't have to live in a hut somewhere, but you should be very aware of all the choices of your life, what your life makes. Put your lifestyle where your mouth yeah. is. Yeah. Um, Kelly. So, so I'm very happy to get this question. Uh, so it, it, in a year's time, from our perspective at Silver Lining, I think what, what would be really great is if policymakers commit that we want to have understanding and better options within a decade, that we, are, we have exposure to risk that, we are, that is unacceptable. And we have the ability to innovate in this country and, and we commit that we're, we're not going to stop until we have better answers. And at, at a tactical level, what that means I think we could do in the next year or two while the academies is, is developing a more comprehensive set of information on what's needed is that we can start to seed research programs and develop capabilities within our research agencies so that right, which right now have none. And so a small amount of initial effort within NOAA, within DOE, within NASA, within NSF to begin to develop our research community and our understanding and ability to input to assessments in the next year or two is really important um, because we have a time-bound problem. So I think those, those are two things I would really like to see policymakers do in the next year. Thank you. With that, let me thank all of you for, for coming, showing up today, uh, and, and, and sitting with us for this really important event. Um, thanks to Silver Lining for, for partnering with us on, on putting this together. And of course, thanks to our very distinguished panel for such a refreshing and engaging conversation. Please go grab some food, uh, enjoy, and let's carry the conversation forward. <laughs>